Hello and welcome to this live special program from the Global Med World Headquarters in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm Roger Downey. Few people doubt that we face a health care delivery problem in this country that will eventually affect many of us. The good news is that technology can help us provide access to health care. Despite the increasing shortage of health care providers and growing numbers of people with health insurance, we can improve outcomes while helping to hold down costs. Of course, we're talking about the treatment of patients remotely with telemedicine. One sector of our society has been proving the value of telemedicine for some time, and it has been a laboratory of sorts for it. These are the correctional facilities in the United States. Each one has as many people in them as a small town or city. But taken together, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of inmates. Federal law requires prisons to provide them with adequate health care while they serve out their sentences. A number of factors are at play here, and we want to examine them during this program. We have a panel of experts with us who can help put the issues of prison health in context and explain telemedicine that is the solution to many of them. And we invite you to send us any questions you might have via the chat, the chat feature on live stream. Now, we will get to as many as we can, plus after the program, we'll also post those questions that you've asked and the answers on the Global Med website. With me in studio is Debbie Voiles. Debbie is the Director of Telemedicine for the Texas Louisiana Telehealth Resource Center in Lubbock, Texas. She has a lot of information to share with us about the effectiveness of telemedicine and about lessons learned in its implementation. And you know when you're dealing with technology, you often get a lot of questions that are fairly technical in nature, and that's why we've invited Susan Silberison, a CIO consultant, to be with us as well. Now certainly, first-hand experience is very important in understanding why correctional in uh, telemedicine is so necessary. And so Dr. Michael Arca, the chief physician and surgeon for telemedicine, and in charge of telemedicine services for the correctional system in California is with us as well. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Now, to set the stage for this conversation, we have a short video, a simulated telemedicine visit with some added comments. All right, good morning, Mr. Michaels. How are you feeling? Well, <coughs> pretty much the same. All right, how did you do last night? I didn't get much shut eye. I pretty much fall asleep <coughs> and wake up coughing all night. All right, so you've been fighting this for a couple days now. I think this is probably more than just a simple cold. I think we should probably get a doctor involved. You get to go now? Uh, well, actually, <coughs> later. we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to stay right here. We're going to use this mobile telemedicine station to contact the provider. Dr. Evans is in Gardenia um, off-site. We're going we're gonna to contact her. Let me get this thing ready. Hello, this is Dr. Evans. Who's calling, please? Hi, Dr. Evans. This is Jerry Barnes. I'm the head medic here at Bartlett Prison. I have one of our inmates here with me. This is Jeffrey Michaels. He's been suffering the last couple days from a cold. Uh, we can provide services to inmates without having them leave the facility. Um, Safety-wise, um, it helps both the correctional and helps the site that they would be going into, the physician site. So most of the time, we can keep them from ever having to leave. Um, traditionally, we've seen about 56% of inmates that are, that are seen through telemedicine never have to leave the facility. Telemedicine also helps resolve the issue of who pays for an inmate's health care while eliminating the risk to other patients and providers in a hospital emergency department. So that's a cost savings for the state, but it's also a safety issue because when an inmate leaves, two guards have to transport that patient and then two more guards have to replace them. So it's a cost, costly event to get an inmate transported for something that might be a 15 or 20 minute visit that need, didn't need to be transported in the first place. So we get a lot of calls that we call arrestitis. We know they're there simply to get out of jail. The truth is, in our system, if you say the right words and you're arrested, they're brought to the ER. The jail and the, that correctional system does not want to pay the emergency room bill. 
so they de-arrest them. They do. And leave. And they're now my patient. And I have to sort it out. And it's very difficult because I'm discharging these patients, people to home, they're patients. And, and sometimes they'll tell us, tell us when you're ready to discharge the patient so that we can come back and pick them up. That's a really odd situation, but that's my world. Well, Michaels, I hope you feel better. It will probably take about 24 hours. Thanks for your help, Jerry. We'll end our visit now and let you take it from here. You probably noticed that Debbie Voiles was part of that video, and the other person was Dr. Phil Johnson, an emergency medicine physician in Shola, Arizona. We're going to hear a little bit more from Dr. Johnson a little later. Dr. Arca, let's begin with you. Give us a snapshot of uh, how you became involved in telemedicine, how long you've been with the California system. You know, I've been with the California system for a little bit over five years now, and about three years ago is when we really started increasing the infrastructure for telemedicine, really started getting involved in expanding telemedicine, and uh, I became very intrigued. I've always been interested in kind of IT, computers, medicine, and it was just a nice transition. And I've been with telemedicine for a little over three years now. Now, a lot of physicians would say, you know, I really have to touch the patient. So how do you come back when somebody tells you that? You know, initially I had the first thought and the first couple of clinics I did doing primary care, I thought to myself, well, how am I going to do this when I can't touch the patient? But on our, at our facilities that present the patients to the physicians, we actually have uh, telemedicine registered nurses there that help us present the patients. And you learn very quickly that you don't have to have, you don't have to be hands-on to have um, an adequate physical exam. Okay. You can actually do quite a bit. Well, we'll come back to you for your presentation in just a moment, but uh, let's also talk to Debbie Voiles. Uh, your academic background, uh, you provide a lot of support and help and information to people who are thinking about starting a telemedicine program, but you're also involved with the university there in Lubbock. That right? is correct. We have, um, at the university, we've been doing telemedicine since 1990. Um, we've got 15 correctional sites that we do telemedicine with and currently we have about 13 community sites throughout West Texas. And part of that uh, effort is also involved in the, the, the state of Texas correctional system, right? That is correct. Okay. Now we also have with us Sue Silberison, who is a CIO consultant. Sue, tell us uh, what are some of the concerns that are always talked about when you're talking about communicating over long distance? Some of the biggest concerns have to do with bandwidth, the uh, ability for the organization, correctional facility or otherwise, to get the connections in that they need um, to make the tools perform the way they expect them to perform. Uh, at the end of the day, it really comes down to good collaboration with your technology people and making sure that they understand what you need mm -hmm. and that they're prepped and ready to go and they can offer those tools up to you so that you can make your telemedicine experience successful. Well, now that you've met our panelists, uh, we invite you to send us any question you might have. Again, type it into the chat feature on live stream, and when we get it, we'll uh, try to answer those questions. As Dr. Arca explained, he's had several years experience with telemedicine in California. So, Doctor, uh, please begin your presentation for us. Well, we'll talk about uh, telemedicine in the California correctional setting. And to start off, uh, just to give a brief overview of kind of how we got where we are telemedically, it kind of, we have to kind of go back and see what the history of uh, medical care within the California Department of Corrections was. And uh, on the slide in front of you, uh, starting in 2001, there was a federal class action lawsuit that basically stated that our medical care violated the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And from 2001 to 2006, uh, unfortunately, things did not improve. And so at that point, a federal receiver was uh, appointed to oversee the medical care in California. Now, since that time, it seems like we, telemedicine really gained traction because uh, in 2006 to 2008, part of the PLATA settlement, which was legislative authorized, gave us funding for telemedicine nurses at all 33 of our institutions throughout California. Uh, also, 
telemedicine equipment, and network infrastructure. In 2008, the federal receiver turned out a turnaround plan of action specifically listing the expansion of telemedicine as a priority, not just uh, to improve infrastructure. I don't believe it's on here, but also to increase telemedicine to partially compensate for the primary care recruitment challenges that we were having at our very remote areas, our rural areas. In, uh, and more recently in 2012, the LAO office, also known as the Legislative Analyst Office report, recommended expansion of specialty in primary care telemedicine. And most recently this year, there was a report from uh, health management uh, assessment that recommended the increased use and expansion of primary care telemedicine. Now, when you started with uh, the California system, you, the, you, were, you walked in on all of some of this, right? That's correct. We were kind of uh, midstream, just in the midst of going from uh, ISDN lines to switching to broadband lines, getting outside providers to see our patients, basically just expanding our infrastructure. So we were kind of still in the infancy stages, if you will. Okay. On the next page, you can see there should be a map of California, and you can see that our 33 institutions are pretty well spread out all the way from the top left, Pelican Bay, to the bottom right on the Arizona-Mexico border. We have institutions, uh, all 33 institutions just spread throughout. We have two female institutions, 31 male institutions, and each of our institutions has anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 plus uh, inmate patients, is what we say, at any given time. Our current statewide population is approximately 120,000. Now, when I came on board in 2008, our population was closer to the 170,000 plus. So with, I don't know if you've been listening to the news, um, but have. with the realignment going on, uh, our population has steadily decreased. A lot of our population is going to the county facilities instead of coming to the state facilities. So we're currently currently at about 120,000 uh, patients statewide. And that's staying fairly stable now. Right now it's fairly stable. Uh, from reading the, the news, there is another court order, uh, a federal court order to decrease our population by, I believe, another 10,000 to get us to about 137.5% capacity of what we were initially intended for. Wow, okay. Uh, on the next slide, you'll notice that along with the 33 institutions, we actually have a new institution opening up next month. We call it uh, CCHCF Stockton or you can just call it the new Stockton facility. It will be our 34th institution, and it is basically a medical institution. It is going to have somewhere in the realm of 1,700 inmate patients. Uh, the majority of those are gonna be very high acuity patients. Um, one of the differences we have with this Stockton facility, one of the challenges that we've had that we haven't had in the past is we're, we are going to have to bring the technology to the patient's bedside. Uh, we want to be able to do bedside consultations. We wanted the equipment to be wireless, battery powered, basically mobile workstations. And uh, so just that's, that's, how we <laughs> right. that's how we met up. And uh, sure. Global Med is actually able to get us um, past a lot of those obstacles. And one of the, I guess one of the untold things about corrections in this country is that the population of prison in, in, inmates is, is growing older. It, it's, they are growing older because they're in there for longer terms. Absolutely correct. I believe in our system you are considered elderly when you hit 55 years old. And with realignment, it appears that a lot of our younger population is going to the county facilities which means that our average patient age is actually increasing. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the patients that we have are older and, and sicker. Sure. On the next page, you'll see that 
telemedicine isn't a standalone department. We actually collaborate with uh, numerous other entities. And just looking at this list here, medical, nursing, custody, uh, definitely IT, um, medical records. We've got hub administration, hub providers, scheduling, allied health, offsite scheduling, utilization management. Uh, I should have quality management on here as well. And so it's, uh, it's a collaboration and not just one unit kind of running the show. On the next slide, you'll just see that um, we're going to take a quick look at some telemedicine data and trends for encounters, some specialties that we offer, our hubs, and our providers. Uh, the next slide should show basically a bunch of bar graphs. This gives us an idea of the percent of our specialty encounters that are done telemedically. And across the bottom are all 33 of our institutions. Um, across the left-hand side is percentages. And if you go to the bottom left, ISP, that's Ironwood State Prison, 89% of all of their specialty encounters um, are done telemedically. They are in a rural location. They're near the California Arizona slash Mexico border. They don't have a lot of facilities nearby to draw from. So they are a, a really big user of telemedicine. Um, if you look at this uh, red or orange bar in the middle of the screen, that was a goal set out by our administration back in about 2010, where we wanted at least 40% of all specialty encounters to be done telemedically. As you can see, it, about all but six institutions are, are hitting that goal. You know, that's a, a hard slide to see in a small format. I just want to remind our audience that we will provide that information. Uh, those slides, we'll put those on our website or at least uh, in a place where you can access them and see them a little bit better. Uh, but it looks like uh, the, your goals, you've exceeded your goals quite considerably. Yes, if you look at the statewide average, just taking all 33 facilities into consideration, we're about 59% of our specialty encounters are done telemedically. Now, we do not include procedures. You can't do procedures telemedically. Uh, there's some other things we take out for maybe specialties we don't offer. Um, uh, for providers coming on site. But other than that, about 59% of our encounters statewide are done telemedically, which is, which is pretty good. Okay. On the next slide, this gives us an idea of how many encounters we are doing over a six month time frame. This just goes from uh, December 2012 to May 2013. And hopefully this shows up a little bit better than the last one. But in blue, it shows that our specialty encounters range anywhere from about 5, uh, 1,400 encounters per month, anywhere up to about 1,800 encounters per month. And that's for specialty. And for primary care is down here in, in red or orange. And that's anywhere from about 200 to 400 visits per month. And that's using roughly uh, two full-time primary care doctors. The next slide gives you an idea of the services that we offer statewide. Um, I won't read them all, but it's anywhere from allergy to vascular surgery, um, some of the more specific specialties we offer would be transgender. Uh, that's something we offer our patients. Uh, mental health psychiatry should also be on this list, and I didn't see that on there, but you see the surgical specialties, the surgical subspecialties a lot of internal medicine and internal medicine subspecialties. And so we, we have a pretty good variety of specialties. I believe we have about 25 or 26 different specialties. Impressive. The next slide um, should be a pie chart, probably difficult to read. I apologize for that. The large slice of pie on the left, the big blue one, represents telemedicine and uh, represents primary care telemedicine. That represents about 25-26% of all of our telemedicine encounters. What's going to be tougher for you to distinguish on this graph, probably from your end, is the next, the next specialties that we use most often. And just to let you know, if you can't read it, 
Ortho is a pretty big utilizer. Infectious disease, neurology, endocrinology, dermatology, rheumatology, cardiology, nephrology, transgender, those are all um, utilized quite often in our system. Less so a lot of the surgical subspecialties. You'll notice here uh, we have maxillofacial surgery, it's like 0.05%. I think we've had maybe 15 or 20 encounters in the last uh, two years. So not a heavy hitter, but we still offer that to our providers. The next page shows our telemedicine hub trend. And just to give a definition, if you're not familiar, the hubs are contracted sites throughout the state that the contracted specialists three see patients through. And so just for instance, there might be a hub in Bakersfield, California, and physicians all around Bakersfield, California will drive to this hub and see patients ut utilizing their equipment, utilizing their staff, and they see our patients all over the state. So some hubs might only have one specialty provider. Some hubs might have 15, 20 specialty providers associated with them. And we currently have, uh, if you look to the far right, about 19 to 20 of these specialty hubs. And that was quite an increase from 2006, 2007, when we had about five. So wow. we've increased that quite a bit. Also, The next page shows our provider trends. This just shows how many providers see our patients telemedically statewide. From 2006 to 2007, we had a little over 20 specialists around the state seeing our providers. And currently, we're coming up on just about 200 providers seeing our patients uh, statewide. And to what do you attribute that increase? You know, a, a lot of things. I think getting the infra infrastructure in place, getting the equipment in place was a big step because without that equipment, you can bring on as many providers as you want. But if you don't have the equipment to facilitate the encounters, then, then it's just a no-go. But I believe a couple providers were brave initial on, tried it. Um, they tell their friends, they tell their friends. A lot of the hospitals, I'm sure, appreciate um, seeing the patients via telemedicine and maybe not having the, the orange jumpsuits going through their, their waiting rooms. So I think it's just gotten a little more popular as time goes on, plus the need for telemedicine with all of our 33 facilities, everyone's under budget constraints to try to decrease transportation costs, um, keep public safety in mind, that it's, it's really taken off over the last couple of years. All right. And just to finish up, you know, what does the future hold for at least California and telemedicine? Uh, some of the things we're looking at right now is incorporating the emergency room into our um, institutions. Every institution kind of has a main medical area that kind of functions as a telemedicine center, functions as an urgent care area, kind of a central health area. And if we can incorporate telemedicine ER into that setting, I think that would help us decrease a lot of the send outs. Um, be able to get you know specialty advice at a at a moment's notice would be very beneficial for a lot of our providers sure. statewide. Well, I appreciate that presentation, but stay on the line with us because uh, in case we get some questions, we'll certainly funnel them to you. But now let's move Thank over you. to Debbie Voyles, who is again with the uh, Texas L Texas. I want to almost say Tex Law. Is that Tex Law? Tex Law. Yes. The Tex Law Telehealth Resource Center in Lubbock, and you also can tell us more about uh, telemedicine and its uh, uh, you know effectiveness in various settings, but specifically in Texas correctional yes. facilities. Yes. Yes. We have actually been doing um, correctional health care at the university for, for quite a while, I think, um, started in the mid-1990s and provide quite a bit of health care services to, to them. So kind of, I'm going to start by taking a, a broad view okay. of health care in general. And whereas this slide talks about a lot of the challenges that we face in rural health care is the same challenges we face when, when it comes to corrections. Just to give you a broad overview of, of some of the issues that, that we face across the United States, you know, currently 
um, numbers as of the October 2012, there were two or there were 5,267 primary care hipses across the United States, with about 55 million people living in those. Um, you know, we have a, a shortage of health care providers, and unfortunately, in order to meet the health care needs of the people in the United States, it'd take over 15,000 new practitioners to meet those oh primary health care needs. And so, you know, primary care is not the other, is not the only issue, especially when it comes to correctional. Mental health is a big challenge in the yes. corrections and mental health care across the United States is a challenge. There's currently about 3,700 mental health care hipses across the United States with about 87 million people living in them. So it would take over um, 5,800 mental health providers to meet the, their health care needs. And so those are challenges that are in the rural areas. Those are challenges that also affect our correctional facilities as sure. well. And so, you know, we run into those kind of things. Um, one of the other challenges we have with correctional health care is, you know, just the numbers are growing across the United States. 1980 to 2009 shows that the increase in um, incarceration has grown about 16 percent um, mm -hmm. over that time period. But where the numbers really have effect is the aging population. So those over the age of 55, um, that number has increased about 80%. Wow. So we're dealing with a really um, aging population that, you know, they're dealing with chronic conditions. Um, and so that's where, you know, we have a challenge in, you know, congestive heart failure and hypertension and diabetes and, you know, end stage renal um, plus conditions of HIV, hep C, those things, and how you manage those mm -hmm. in, in these correctional settings. And so, you know, this is a challenge um, that we face, to not only just in regular health care. Sure. Um, but in correctional health care, it it's even more challenging because trying to find providers to take care of these patients um, it is a challenge. Um, in, there was a Pew report that was done in 2008 that said that we were spending $3.7 billion per year mm -hmm. in medical cost alone to take care of correctional inmates across the United States. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, and that's just the health care side of it. That doesn't include the transportation cost if you are transporting a patient, um, the security cost, those kind of things that are in, di in addition to this um, $3.7 billion. So, you know, looking at technology as a way to offset some of those costs is where, you know, things are, are really going. There's a lot of service lines that, that, that you can do. Um, one of the things that um, we talk about when we're, when we're developing telemedicine is pretty much anything that you can do in a face-to-face -face encounter, there's a way to replicate it through technology. Mm -hmm. And so we're always looking at that. At the university with the 15 correctional sites that we have, the majority of what we do is mental health. Uh, mental health is probably the easiest telemedicine service that, that's available and we probably see about 700 um, inmates a month just for mental health services. And those are replicated each month? Then, right? Yes, exactly. And so that is the biggest, you know, they are, mental health needs are the biggest users of services as far as what we face correction wise um, on our side of the state. Um, the university, um, it, as far as Texas goes, there's, there's um, I-35, there's a line that goes I-35. Everything west um, is what our service territory is. It's about 49% of the land mass, but only about 12% of the population. Ooh. Everything east, as far as corrections go, is managed by the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And so the, the difference between the two sides of the state, we have about 33,000 inmates um, over our half of, half of the geographic area. Um, they have about 117,000 inmates on their side. A lot more on their um, side. A lot more on their side, but they're um, a lot more geographically com um, compacted, so they don't have to travel as far as, as what we do. We've got um, sites down in El Paso, 
and Lubbock is the is what our hub site is as far as corrections go. And so um, from El Paso to Lubbock is about 350 miles one way. So transporting those patients, um, those inmates up to Lubbock is a challenge. Um, the some of the statistics that we've looked at over the years, um, it cost about $300 on average to transport a patient. So if you take that $300 um, dollars times even just $700, looking at the tech side, $700, that's you know $210,000 a month just in transportation costs. Plus you just don't take one prisoner. No, you don't. You, t you take multiple prisoners. But you know the benefits of the technology is you know not only savings in the co cost in transportation, you're giving them access to specialty care and you're providing it in a safe environment. So you don't have those inmates out on the road traveling. You're not putting security guards at risk for healthcare services. You're not putting the medical staff um, in the facilities that they're going to um, mm -hmm. at risk um, for security purposes. And so that um, is a benefit. But, but another benefit, at least in the state of Texas, you know, the patients like it because a lot of times when they have to leave their facility for health care services, there is no guarantee that they're actually going to go back to their same unit, their same bed. Sure. And so it's, you know, it's a challenge to them. Um, and so most of them either will refuse health care right. in some cases or, you know, we can step in with telemedicine so that we keep them where they're at and keep them happy, which is, you know, one of the requirements. We have to provide them health care, um, and it's good for them as well. So the inmates like it. We can, you know, we can monitor them better. We can provide those services a lot better. So, you know, it, licensure, uh, one of the questions that had come up was licensure. Obviously, um, we follow the same rules and regulations for correctional inmates as we do for anybody else being seen in telemedicine. Okay. So the physician has to be licensed um, in the state where the patient is. Um, we have to follow the same um, procedures as far, far as consents, documentation, things like that. So we don't treat them any differently than we would a community patient. So, you know, that's one of the benefits of, of what we do is we try to treat them just the same as we would a face-to-face. -face. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the whole aspect of, first of all, correctional telemedicine is, is relatively new in the sense that only because of federal mandates have people really sat up and took notice that there, we have a population here that needs health care, and without it, they're, they're suffering. Um, so we have patients, let's say, in, in prison who um, need health care, but in the past when they told people that, they would say, are you kidding us or is this, this for real? In other words, it was very difficult to determine whether this was a hoax patient mm -hmm. or somebody who was really needing medical care. What has telemedicine done to that situation? To well, you know, in, as far as in Texas goes, we have, the majority of our units have some type of um, mid-level to provider to a physician, and, and they're their first line of defense. So they can determine whether, you know, something is, if they can take care of that situation. If it gets to the point where they're just not sure, we can put them in front of a specialist and let the specialist determine whether um, it's something that needs to be transported in. Um, traditionally, um, we can keep anywhere from, you know, for a medical care, we keep most, about 65% of the inmates in their units um, without ever having to leave because we can manage it through the technology. So we are, you know, we're utilizing it to determine when, when the case is that it has to be done mm -hmm. for a surgery or some type of procedure that just can't be done on the unit. So, um, you know, we've got great results with use, using the technology to, to keep some of that stuff from happening. Well, we've had some questions uh, from people who have pre-registered uh, to watch this, uh, this webinar, and uh, we'll go through some of these, but if we, don't, if, if we haven't touched on something that uh, is of concern to you, please 
uh, send us that question via the chat feature on live stream and we'll answer that or attempt to. One of these is, what do you think the biggest obstacle is to adopting video conferencing for use in correctional facilities? For example, connecting inmates to specialists outside the correctional facility. I'm going to start, start with Dr. Arca because we haven't heard from you here in the last few minutes. What do you think some of those obstacles are, Doctor? You know, I think we ran into different obstacles at different stages of the game. Initially, it was uh, getting the, the budget and the infrastructure in place. And after that, it was actually getting medical, nursing, custody, IT on board to kind of just collaborate with us, to, to work with us, to, to have buy-in from, from them. Um, after, after all that was said and done, the next biggest thing, or the next biggest challenge was getting outside providers to see our, our inmate population. And um, so that's probably the obstacles to date. You know, once uh, you get the equipment, that's just the beginning. You've got a lot of other things you have to put in place, the infrastructure, um, just the arrangements that you need, right? Yes. You know, the, the technology is really the easy part with, when it comes to telemedicine, um, even in correctional settings. You know, the challenging part is developing the, the, the policies and the procedures on how you're going to, to identify what patients need to be seen uh, that can't be handled. Um, and then the, another challenge is just the turnover in correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we seem to be constantly training new staff on how to use the equipment. So that's, you know, that's always a challenge. But, um, and as Dr. Arca said, you know, the initial cost of the equipment, I mean, that's a challenge. But the hardest part is getting the providers to want to see the patients, making them under, you know, realize that, okay, we can um, bring you into the facility electronically so you're not having to mm -hmm. travel um, or they're not having to have the, those inmates in, in your facility where you have other patients um, that you're seeing that are not incarcerated. Is that sort of an educational process to try to educate the physician as to what telemedicine is all about? Oh definitely, okay. definitely. You know we spend a lot of time um, educating new providers on what we can do um, through the technology. You know as it was mentioned what do you do when when they want to, you know, lay their hands on you. I mean, that's something that when somebody hasn't ever experienced that before, um, understanding that there's somebody on the far side that is presenting the patient that's qualified to, to learn how to, you know, run the stethoscope, run how, how to run um, cameras to see close-ups of the skin for dermatology. Yes. Um, we've even had um, staff work with our orthopedic surgeons to learn how to do a Lockman's exam on the knee. So that, you know, those are the kind of things that we really work with, educating not only the providers, but the staff at the unit so that they know how to interact with the physicians. Yeah, you know, a lot of times, I'm gonna ask you this, uh, Sue, because uh, a lot of times what happens is people are afraid of technology. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's it. And the only way to really address that is the hands-on mm -hmm. training the education, the actual experience with the technology where you see one step off from what you're used to, but it's still the same experience and that you could utilize people on the other side of it to give you what you can't get through the camera or through any of the readings that you get. It is difficult, but education and training do, do remove that as an obstacle over time. Well, let's move on to another question. We are considering linking with our local county jail. I am interested in any data that could be provided that would support this application. I imagine there are some jails that are using telemedicine in Texas? There are some jails. Um, not as many um, jails right now, but as um, state facilities. But one of the things that we always talk, talk about is look at what the cost savings in transportation. So how much is that jail actually paying to transport patients to an outside facility um, provider? So that's where you can get them to understand where the benefit is. You know, what, you know, you've got to have two security guards for the, to transport the inmate. And so that means you've got to have two more security guards stay at the facility. So you're over, you know, over booking security guards when you have to transport somebody. So the cost associated with that alone 
um, is a good benefit for the, the jails to want to look at the technology. You know, aside from the cost, there's also the security yes. issue. And Dr. Phil Johnson, who you heard from earlier in this program, again is the uh, emergency medicine chair at uh, Summit Healthcare in Sholo, Arizona. And he sees uh, the security issue as issue B. Issue B is now they're in jail. They've been in jail. They're incarcerated and they're brought to my emergency room for whatever reason. A major I would say 80% of those chief complaints that come to my ER would not, do not need to be here. But the other issues that come through my mind are just that. I need to keep this, my safe, the safety of my staff is paramount. I'm going to be the doctor and I'm going to take care of them. But that is an issue. And, and you know, is that guard going to stay there the whole time? I don't really know what they were in there for. Is this going to be an issue that they're going to try to bolt from jail? And so that is a very real event that I have to think about as a doctor going into that room. And my ER staff has to think about it. And that is a concern to me. Absolutely. Of course, Dr. Johnson is concerned about security and his ER with uh, inmates uh, who may be in for violent issues, violent crimes. And a lot of times the providers don't know exactly what they're in. And then uh, is the security guard always going to be present? That's another aspect that who knows? Uh, well, they should always be present. But, you know, there are occasions, have been occasions in the past where um, inmates have been in the emergency room and gotten isolated with nursing staff and um, held them hostage. And so, you know, this is a security issue yes. that, that is huge. And this is where, um, you know, if we can keep those kind of things from happening by utilizing technology, I mean, that's a safety feature for not only the staff, but, you know, the public as a whole, because you're, you don't have those inmates out on the road, you don't have them in um, public facilities mm -hmm. um, getting access to health care. Uh, we have a question here. What training is provided to your nursing staff to participate in telemedicine encounters, and how are these encounters documented? Doctor, we're going to ask you that question. How do you handle that in California? Our nurses, we have three regional telemedicine nurses that um, are here directly in our department. I think one of them, two are downstairs, and one is in Southern California, and they are the ones that go out and train our 33 nurses and whenever there's turnover they go out there and they train them again they train them on the uh, not just the equipment but how to use the telemedicine technology to listen to the heart and lungs um, and then they do the typical training like how do we send paperwork back and forth how do we do the scheduling and so um, our nurses here at at headquarters are are, are pivotal um, uh, I, I myself with some other staff when we do have new specialty providers come on, we kind of do a, a training for them as well, give them an intro to correctional medicine as a whole, just so they're not, just so they're familiar with it when, when they start. Now, Debbie mentioned turnover among staff. Is that an issue in California? It is, and maybe with all different types of medical settings, um, nursing has their way of doing things, medical has their way of doing things. And unfortunately, I can't dictate to some of the other departments how they should uh, manage their staff. And so I believe this year there's a, a post and bid process going on with our, with our nursing staff. And so I believe, I think about 25 to 30 percent of them are going to be turning over. So we're going to have to make sure we get out there and, and train them. Well, it sounds like your training staff is going to be pretty, pretty busy here in the next uh, <laughs> several months. Yes. Well, let's move on here. Can you address telemental health in the correctional setting? I think we did that with you, Debbie. Um, we'll just pass over that. But it, the, the other part of this question is, is psychiatry included in the primary care numbers for California's telehealth slides? Uh, so I guess we'll throw that back at you, Dr. Arkin. You know what? I did not include those, but I have, oh, where'd it go? I have one of the slides that we didn't include right in front of me. <laughs> and right now, the the primary, the mental health portion of our telemedicine 
um, is on the verge of expanding, but it will be expanding under the mental health program. Up until about uh, last month, we were overseeing the mental health portion, and I would say our numbers were probably about 3,500 to 4,000 for the fiscal year to date. And so they were pretty close to the primary care numbers. I think it was just a little bit less, but pretty close to the primary care numbers. And in the next six months to a year, I believe they're trying to hire a lot more psychiatrists and get a lot more units up. And so those numbers will be increasing as well. So that, that's the reason why the numbers aren't as high. It's because you don't have the practitioners available. Absolutely right. Okay. That sounds like a... A problem that might be in Texas too? Oh yes, uh, mental health is, finding mental health providers is a challenge um, across the across Texas and um, we have at the university um, all of our uh, mental health providers as far as psychiatrists go are actually under our uh, contract so they actually work for us as opposed to working out in the community so mm -hmm. we um, have control over them. They stay very, very busy, not only seeing telemedicine patients, but we have an in-house psych psychiatry unit in Lubbock, and so they see, see the in-house patients as well. So, um, but keeping them on staff is, is definitely challenging. The fact that um, mental health is actually what drove us to looking at telemedicine because of the amount of time physicians were spending on the road traveling to all of the remote sites. Um, we documented back in the in the mid 90s that by doing telemedicine once we incorporated it um, they were saving about 22 hours a week um, that they were getting to see more patients as opposed to out on the road traveling you know one thing we haven't addressed yet and that is somebody might ask well why if the if the physician is in the same town as the prison why doesn't the physician just go to the prison and see oh, the patients you know, it, for anybody that has ever had to go into a, a, a facility, for those that you that haven't, you know, you go through up through the the front door, and there's a sign on the front door that says, um, "No hostages are going to be are, are going to leave." And so that's a daunting sight to, before you even get through the security, and then going through all the security. There's rules and regulations of what you can take in and how you can take things in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you think going through airport security is tough, try getting into a, a jail and going through their security. So it's really daunting to try to get people to go in um, that aren't used to that. Yeah. Um, scary. Is it, is it is very scary. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. The only question this person says I would really have or question is that the two presenters come from big geographic states with very large prison populations. I'm in Massachusetts. We hardly ever throw anyone in jail. And more importantly, I want to make sure that what they're talking about also applies to a state of our size. I'm sure it does, but... Oh, I think that the same issues that you have in a, in a large state are the same ones that you have in a small state. You know, whether, whether you have 100 inmates or you have, you know, 150,000 inmates, I mean, security is something that you need to think about. Um, just transportation costs, but the security is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, keeping those inmates behind the the prison wires and not out on the, out on the road for health care services is um, is a benefit to the community as a whole as well as the providers. Okay, is there a contract involved or is a pay-per-use type of product? Let's have Dr. Arca answer that one first. I guess uh, the answer would be maybe yes to both. Um, our system currently utilizes a statewide PPO contract for getting the telemedicine specialist around the state on board. And then for every single encounter, that's billed as though, I believe it's um, billed and paid out at the same rate as the patient being seen in person in the office. And so that would be yes to both. Now, does Medicaid pay for some of these prison visits? For us, for the state of California, yes. um, from what I understand, the state pays for all state the visits. Does. But we do, but we do bill the same as Medi Medicare rates. Okay. 
What about uh, that question, uh, is there a contract uh, or is it paper use in Texas? No, um, it, there's two contracts in the state of Texas for the state facilities. Texas Tech has one for the western side. UTMB has the one for the eastern side. And with those contracts, we're responsible for the entire health care um, facility from providing medical services, mental health services, pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So um, we're contracted to, to do that. Our physicians get paid, um, they bill the same as face-to-face, uh, -face, and I think that they get reimbursed about Medicaid rates, where it's just not very good. But, you know, that's, that's what we, we do in Texas. I know there are other states out there that um, have different contracts, um, depending on whether it's state-run or um, privately-run facilities. So I would agree with Dr. Arca, we kind of have both. Is it fair to say that, that there's really no one recipe here? No, there's not. Um, whatever, you know, you can make work to the, to the best um, of what the circumstances you're dealing with, you know, those are, that's what we look at. So There are companies that sort of take that uh, on themselves, sign a contract with the state, and provide all the, the things that are needed in a telemedicine program, right? That is correct. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's one aspect of what you might look at. What is the health care? Well, that one's pretty basic. We won't even go there. Um, how do medical providers use telemed if the session requires at some point physical contact for assessment purposes? Now, we've probably already touched on that, but why don't you explain again? Oh, um, one of the requirements, especially in Texas and as in many states, you have to have a certified health care provider with the patient, um, except for mental health. So that, that provider is going to act as, as the eyes and hands of the physician. And so we really work um, with training the, the patient side presenters on how to, how to do procedures. Um, if there's certain things that a specialist want to see done, um, we work with um, those outlying providers so that they know, um, or presenters so they know exactly what the physician's wanting and how they want it done. And you have somewhat the same thing in California, Dr. Arca. You have a nurse or someone who is a patient presenter on the patient side? Absolutely right. We have nurses presenting on the patient side. And like Debbie said, if there's a specialist that wants a certain exam done, a lot of times uh, we'll call in at a separate time other than the appointment and do some training over telemedicine. Sometimes our regional nurses can go to the sites and do that specialized training. We have a, uh, where our telemedicine units are located, a lot of physicians are nearby. And so once in a while, the specialist might say, nurse, thank you so much for your help. I, I might need the help of a physician for this. And so a lot of times they'll grab a physician over. If they're available, we can do the, the exam that way. There are some uh, telemedicine specialists that will say, we can do pre-op or post-op, or I can do an initial evaluation before I see you in person. And so those are other ways that we can kind of work it out. And, and we don't want to uh, uh, fool the audience, and I don't think we are. Most of the uh, time you can deal with uh, medical complaints telemedically, but there are always going to be challenges for physicians on the remote end who may feel, I really need to see this person in person, right? That is correct, and we don't ever want to put any physician's licenses at risk. If you feel that you need to see the patient in person, by all means, uh, let us know. A lot of our specialists on the outside will take a look at the patient list uh, a couple of days before they have clinic, and they'll, they might say, you know, the second patient, I, I, I think we're going to have to do that in person, but leave the rest of them. And so, you know, it's, a lot of it can be trial and error. I guess I'm going to ask this question. Um, for everybody on the panel, what are we learning in the correctional system that maybe we can apply among the general population when it comes to treating people at a remote location? Oh, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish through technology. Obviously, um, telemedicine is not the end all be all. No. Um, and we're, we've learned that. Um, but as Dr. Arca said, you know, there's no reason to bring a, a patient in for a pre-op visit, um, then bring them in for a procedure, and then bring them in for a post-op. If you can do that pre-op and the post-op through the technology, I mean, we're, we're saving a lot of time um, and effort 
but we're still providing the services that that patient needs. And so we can take that same philosophy to, the, to a, a community and instead of a patient having to come in and be seen three times in person, now they only have to come in for an actual procedure. And we're doing that, you know, a lot. And that really saves um, people's time and money because, you know, outside of corrections, when you're dealing with rural populations or even urban populations, if you have to travel to see a doctor for a 15-minute visit, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how far you're having to travel, We've got some areas in Texas where patients are traveling 90 miles one way just for primary health care. And so it's an all-day event. You know, they're out of work, kids are out of school, and so it's very costly to that family to pay for those services for that 15-minute visit. So if we can limit that, um, it's a savings to everybody. On the clinical side, Dr. Arca, I would imagine someone, if not yourself, uh, has considered writing papers about uh, the experiences in correctional telemedicine? You know, it, it's crossed my mind. Um, I'll be honest, but uh, I, I've been so busy, I haven't really been able to think outside of just the thought of it. But it would be absolutely interesting. And obviously you could provide some insight to others who might be considering, uh, you know, at least uh, to expand their telemedicine program. There, there are a lot of places around the country that have it already, but they don't have everything. And I think uh, they're looking at ways to make that happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's see, what, uh, do you recommend an information sheet about medical services and expectations that to, should be given to inmates at the time of admission? Oh, I, I think so. I think, uh, you know, we try to treat patients, whether they're correctional patients or community patients, exactly as you would a face-to-face. -face. Um, in Texas, and I assume, you know, I, you don't assume, but I would believe that it's this way in most um, states, when an inmate comes into the, into the system, they go through a um, evaluation process. So they, they're intake, they have physical, so they know exactly what kind of health care issues that they have when they're coming in. At that point in time, you know, they're told about how you obtain services and they're, they're really taught, you know, taught how to, how to not only services for health care but for other needs. And so that's a good time to provide that information just so that they know. And doctor, I, I assume that you have an admission procedure as well, right? Yeah, yes, for the admission procedure. I would like to just take it one step further. Okay. We actually provide our specialist kind of in uh, telemedicine pearls sheet, if you will, uh, when they come on board, just to give them an idea of uh, the atmosphere they're coming into. And things on there will say, you know, remind you not to talk about personal information with, with the inmate patient. Um, don't make any promises, you know, try to stick to our formulary. Uh, and one of the things that I always have to remind them is it's not like your typical community setting where you just have appointments scheduled all day long and one patient can maybe run 40 minutes, the next patient runs 20 minutes, and you can have some flexibility there. One of the toughest parts for our specialists in telemedicine is if they're scheduled every half an hour and Pelican Bay is going to be calling it, 10 o'clock and then San Quentin's going to be calling at 1030, you know, you have this defined time frame of where you need to see the patient, get the information, do your exam, finish, and then you know that you're going to have someone else calling in at 1030. So they kind of have to be on a, on a tight ship. I understand. So, there, you know, obviously there are some times when I guess the patient is chatty and, you know, you have to cut them off. Yes, and also our telemedicine coordinators and the physicians are pretty good about saying, okay, this one's running a little late. Can someone call ahead to the next institution and tell them to give us another five minutes, another ten minutes? And we, we usually work it out pretty good. Well, uh, I, I presume that that's uh, working very well for you there in California. Dr. Arca, uh, who is uh, the Director of Telemedicine Services at the California Prison System, thank you so much for being with us today. Also, I want to say Thank thanks you. to Debbie Voiles, who is the thanks. telemedicine director at uh, the Tex La uh, Telehealth Resource Center in Lubbock and also involved with the university there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really get much to talk to you, Sue, but uh, Susan Silberison, who is a CIO consultant, she was here just in case you had some technical questions that we couldn't handle. 
Plus, uh, all of this information will be in this program, which will be, again, on our website here in the next day or so. We're also going to take the questions that we did get and answer and put them on the website as for, for you as well. So if you were unable to see this program at the very beginning or you just, uh, just tuned in now, uh, we'll have this whole program for you to watch at some time in the next day or two. I'm Roger Downey, and from the Global Med World Headquarters in Scottsdale, Arizona, you've been listening and viewing this special live program on correction of telemedicine. Thank you for joining us, and we will have another program for you in the next month or so. Uh, check with our website occasionally, and you'll find out what the topic of the next one will be.